Everything's a fiat system unless it's Bitcoin. Right when I bought it, I had this weird intuitive feeling that I own something really special. Bitcoin's the opposite of debt slavery. It will be way sooner than we think because those wheels that are right now in motion are wheeling very, very quickly. I put both those pieces of land up for sale. All glory to God, they sold. I liquidated all of my real estate. I emptied my savings account. I sold any stocks. I closed out my IRA and I took all that money and I just bought as much Bitcoin as I could with it. We spent hundreds and thousands of years in that abundant mindset, helping one another. Bitcoin, I believe, will return us to that. Bitcoin gives them that. It gives them a reason to be a scientist. It gives them a reason to be, get into tech, into engineering, into mathematics. We want everyone to get on the Bitcoin standard and be involved in Bitcoin in any way, shape, or form that they can. Yes, we could have no longer any central authority if we're under a Bitcoin standard. Why did you get into Bitcoin and what problems did you see in the world that brought you to Bitcoin? Absolutely, Robin. So this is a, I can answer both those right off the bat for me. So personally, a big problem, and I'm from the United States, is the debt crisis and a lot of the debt crisis that all of us are in individually. And I got into Bitcoin actually towards the end of 2023. And the reason I got into it is I have been an investor my whole life in the sense of just being on an exchange and buying stocks, so trying to buy, you know, buy low, sell high. And I found myself in a situation at the end of 2023. I'm a husband and a father, a school teacher. Uh, so therefore, I'm in a lot of debt in order to have a home to be able to raise my family in. I have to have a very high mortgage. In order to do what I love, which is teach, I had to get a very high education, which was a high cost. So like most Americans, just to have what we need, and most of us, we need a home if we want to have a family and we need an education if we want to do a job we love. The situation we're in is that that puts us in a large amount of debt. And what that does is it really, it the word, it's it, it's a very serious word, but I'm going to use it as, as a debt slave. That's my problem is, is truly it's debt slavery. So at the end of 2023, Christmas was coming up. And this is a little bit of actually an emotional story and, and my where my love for Bitcoin just skyrocketed because, and it'll give you an idea of a little bit of just who I am and my personal beliefs. I needed some money for Christmas because I wanted to get my kids some Christmas presents and I wanted to get my wife something. And I had no money. I had no money. I had some. I, I always have. I've always been a saver. So I've always had money in a savings account. And I was just in a position in life where I needed to I needed a miracle. And, you know, I, I prayed. I said, God, just please direct me to I need some access to money. And it was so strange because I get this idea to buy some Bitcoin. And this was at the end of 2023 when it was still kind of in its lower value as it was on its way up, but not that big jump. And I had no idea what Bitcoin was. I just kind of knew it was around. I'd heard of it. Um, I was never negative for it. I always thought it was really cool, just what was going on with it. But I was inspired to buy some. And so I bought some just before the end of 2023 with that like wing and a prayer that it would, looking at it purely from an investor standpoint, like I just need this to go up 25% so I could have some Christmas money for my family. And then sure enough, you know, I bought it just at that cusp right before it like just happened to explode and and right before Christmas. So I pulled it out. It was a good investor move at first, but I was so impressed. So I did what I do in investing, which was just sell off some profit. But I held on to the original Bitcoin because I had this interesting feeling that there was something more to it than just it being an investment. Because right when I bought it, I had this weird intuitive feeling that I own something really special. Like right when I pushed the button and bought the Bitcoin, something just hit me that for the first time, it wasn't like just buying a stock that I had no relationship to. Like seeing that I actually had some Bitcoin, I like felt something like powerful. I felt empowered. And then sure enough, you know, the prayer came through and I was able to give my family a Christmas. And that was just that small problem. It solved a problem right away, a very quick and it doesn't always do that. I'm not recommending that's how people play Bitcoin because it's volatile. It just worked out for me to get me on board. So it was kind of a, a spiritual experience. And, you know, it ended up uh, coming into basically this whole idea that, well, well, maybe this can solve a bigger problem of mine, which is this overall 
that, that I have, not just taking care of this individual event that I needed money for Christmas, but now I started looking, can this solve a problem of 10, 20, 30 years down the road that I'm in, getting me out of this fiat currency debt that I'm in? That's where I'm at right now, Robin. What do you got? Are you looking? I, I, I love it already so much. Um, do, are you already looking forward to like maybe do with, with, with Bitcoin a retirement? Like, are you looking like, oh, how, that's, that's how, how many Bitcoin I need to accumulate and be debt free. Uh, do you do those calculations? Like in, in 20 years, I need that amount of Bitcoin. I should not have uh, debt and then I can maybe retire on my stack. Yes. Great question. So, you know what? At yes. first I started doing that. I was watching a bunch of YouTube channels, doing the calculations and then, you know what? And when it comes to, when it comes to anything, I am more of like a fundamentalist than I am a technician. Like I'm still working on understanding Bitcoin. Technically, I'm not a great person to talk about to the technical that Bitcoin is, but I love the fundamentals. So I was doing all those calculations and then all of a sudden it hit me. I just thought, you know what, if I really believe in this thing and I really believe in the long run of it, it's, I just need to simplify it and I just need to go all in and then just hold it until it solves my problem with the faith that it will indeed solve my problem. So what I ended up doing actually was, and this is hardcore, Robin, of how much I, I believe in Bitcoin and I believe in it in the long run. I am fortunate enough where I had some inheritance, some land, from various grandparents. I'm fortunate that I'm like one of the only children in both sides of my family. So I had uh, some real estate that I owned that I'd just been holding on to that was really just costing me money in property tax and whatnot. So I was actually losing money on it, but that was my main store of value that at first I thought I would use for my retirement. I'll just hold on to this land 10, 20 years from now, this land will sell, and then I'll be able to pay off all my debt and retire on that. As soon as I had this, idea of Bitcoin being my new store of value. I put both those pieces of land up for sale. All glory to God, they sold. And I took all that money. I stopped doing any calculations. I stopped doing any of what I need to retire. And I just consolidated all of my money into cash. I liquidated all of my real estate. I emptied my savings account. I sold any stocks. I, I closed out my IRA and took all my IRA money. And there's something about that that's interesting about why I actually like the ETFs and why I think people, the ETFs are useful. Just a small thing on that, if we remember. But I took all that money and I just bought as much Bitcoin as I could with it. And it's fun because, you know, what I've heard is the first rule about Bitcoin is, you know, you don't say how much Bitcoin you have. So I love that rule. But I'll say that based on the calculations that I had done previously, I'm matching up with that. So now it's just having faith and giving it time. And it's been such a, a relief for me because one thing that was really stressful was playing the stock market. And one thing that was really stressful was keeping an eye on the land values and keeping up with the property tax. And now not only is all that stress gone, but it's it's been replaced with joy because I just get to sit back and do what I love, which is teach. And hey, my debt is what it is. And I just make sure I pay my interest payments on it and make sure that it doesn't put me in a position where the authorities are knocking on my door. And I'm just letting Bitcoin do its thing. It's like my guardian angel out there. Just I know it'll take care of me. And, and the stack is, is decent. And I just want it to do its thing. Absolutely. Really cool. Why did you say that uh, ETFs are, are useful? Like where, where is this coming from? Yes. So we're, here's where I, here's where the ETF was useful for me. So when, if you're someone like me and you go hardcore and you just like liquidate everything and put it all into Bitcoin, you're going to, and you have an IRA, you can't pull out the profits on an IRA. You can only take out the contributions tax-free. So I pulled out all my contributions tax-free, but those, I, the profit that I'd had from the IRA, if I were to take it out, it gets heavily, heavily penalized. But thanks to the ETFs, what I did was I just put that profit into the Bitcoin ETFs and the Bitcoin ETFs are actually really, they're doing really good. My Bitcoin ETF that's on my IRA still. So I just basically put all my IRA money into the, the Bitcoin ETF. It's earning a dividend. Um, I kind of get access to a brokerage because these ETFs, these guys are like putting all the power of and technology of the stock market 
into Bitcoin. You know, they're working for you and using bots and trying to buy low and sell high and do all that stressful stuff for you. So it's fun because I basically had some money that I didn't have access to to just buy directly with Bitcoin. It was trapped in the IRA. But because of the ETFs, I was able to take that and still be involved in Bitcoin through it. So I thought that was a really cool opportunity. Wait, wait the, the Bitcoin ETFs pay dividends or do you mean that they just go up with, with that? Like, are you actually paying dividends? Both, both. Yeah, they, they go up with uh, the Bitcoin, depending on which one you pick. You know, you're just kind of reliant on whatever the traders are that are dealing with it. But uh, the one that I, I particularly and I don't know the symbol off the top of my head right now. I should have wrote that down, but. They're paying dividends. Absolutely. So it's just like any other ETF. I get a, a quarterly dividend from it, whether it goes up or down. And then it's, it's doing really well. It's actually performing along with Bitcoin. So they're doing a pretty decent job with it. And it's money that I wouldn't have been able to do anything with anyways because I money. couldn't pull it out. So it's cool that I even had an outlet for it. For Bitcoin. What, what do you think will, will those ETFs do long term for uh, Bitcoin as I think they enable um, a huge market, they, they bring a lot of uh, money in that will otherwise not be spent. Maybe like the, I think uh, you are a great example because you had a haircut then on, on your profits. If you actually want to buy Bitcoin with that, you probably would have maybe just invested in some other stocks, maybe in micro strategy or something like that. Uh, so, but uh, that would be money that otherwise would not be in Bitcoin and you are Bitcoiner. And what, what so in enabling uh, outside people that are not Bitcoiners, but they're also wanting to, to invest in something like that. They're like, hey, let's invest in something new. And they have like uh, 20 million on, on their on the net worth and they're like, yeah, let's put like 1 million of that in Bitcoin because it's a new innovative thing. We don't really think about that. We just put it in. What, what kind of, um, how important do you think is, is, uh, those are those ETFs for Bitcoin? Yeah. Great question, Robin. And again, I'm a fundamentalist. I'm not a technician, so I don't know all the ins and outs of what it could do for Bitcoin technically, but fundamentally the greatest thing I see is the advertisement to it. The fact that, Here's the big thing. We, we want everybody to get on board. We want this to spread. We want everyone to get on the Bitcoin standard and be involved in Bitcoin in any way, shape or form that they can. And the ETFs are putting Bitcoin on the world market, on the world investing market. It's given people a chance like me at the end of uh, 2023, a guy that had never even dipped his foot in the water. Like you just mentioned, there's plenty of people out there that uh, our investors that are now starting to sniff around Bitcoin through the ETFs and they're going to buy some of those ETFs, just like you said, with maybe one, two, three, a certain percentage of their portfolio. And then they're going to get that intuitive feeling like me because Bitcoin's so powerful that as soon as you own some in any way, shape or form, it sparks that conversation in your mind, in your heart, and your soul. It's just got that magic to it. So what my Greatest appreciation for the ETFs is the advertising aspect of it, that it's getting the Bitcoin out there to more people, that more people are going to start getting involved with it through the ETFs. And I think a lot of the people that buy the ETFs or even companies are then going to start buying the Bitcoin directly because they're going to realize, well, why don't I just go and actually get myself some Bitcoin and probably keep their ETFs. So I think the great it's a great I think it's a great thing for Bitcoin fundamentally not understanding the full technical behind it, but that it's just going to get more and more people involved in it. Uh, it's, a, it's a great catalyst for, for Bitcoin, that's for sure. And you mentioned yes, something sir. before that I was really intrigued uh, with Bitcoin being the opposite of the fiat slavery. And I think uh, I want to come back to that just for a moment because I think a lot of people don't see it that way that fear is slavery and i feel very strongly that fear is actually slavery um walk us through like why do you think that this fear and this debt based system is slavery especially as someone who also has stepped and experienced that with the student uh loan and everything like that so you you lived <laughs> as a slave to that fiat system and you found bitcoin now so like that that's a really interesting uh, avenue yeah, absolutely, Robin. And you're, you're 100% right. I'm currently, I'm very grateful for my life. I'm a very rich man in the sense that I have lots of love. I have all the things that you need to be a good human being and have great. I am a financial debt, uh, debt slave. I don't, because that, that's such a powerful word. So I have my rights and I have my freedoms and my liberties, but financially I am indeed a debt slave. So here's the contrast between 
the fiat system is it, it's an inevitable debt slave system. And a lot of this is because of the reason, whether you want to call it uh, debasement or because you want, or you can call it inflation based on the printing of money, which has just been in a way beaten to death. But really the key word here and the reason why fiat is a debt slave system is because it inevitably has to charge interest. That's, and I thought a lot about this and the reason why uh, fiat inevitably leads into a debt slave system. And this is like, you have to almost go biblical with this because there's constant stories in the Bible and they're off a fiat system, whether it's, everything's a fiat system unless it's Bitcoin at this point. Because if you're dealing with metals, you eventually get debasement. They start taking the good stuff out of the metal and putting the bad stuff in, so it loses value. If you switch over to paper, you start printing more of it, so it gets devalued. So anytime you're dealing with money that gets devalued, when you lend it, if I lend, if you lend me a hundred thousand dollars, Robin, in anything besides Bitcoin, even if you're a moral or ethical person, because of the time that it's going to take me to pay you back, even if you don't want to charge me interest, you have to. You have to because that money is going to be worth less by the time I give it back to you, just by the nature of debasement and printing money. And I don't personally take a stance. I don't like to judge people. So. You know, you have to print money if that's what you're dealing with. You have to debase coins as economies grow because you need more money to supply the economy. And we were talking a little bit about Ray Dalio before, and, and we could touch back on him. And I highly recommend the book Changing World Order. So, yeah, I only understood about 25 percent of it, but it helps you understand the nature of money, as he puts it. And he basically what I got from it in summary was any type of money eventually gets debased or printed because it has to, because you need more of it to drive the economy and therefore the value drops. And then that value dropping is replaced with interest. So we're in a situation now, and this situation is biblical because there was stories in the Bible, many of them where that are covering the Israelites, they're using metal and they had a system where every 50 years, they would actually just do what they call Jubilee. They would just wipe out all debts because it happens so often using metal as a currency, put everybody into debt slavery. Every 50 years, it was like they'd start it and they'd notice that everybody would drop into debt slavery by the end of 50 years. And just instinctively, they would wipe out all the debt every 50 years. That's how reliable it is that fiat currency leads you into debt slavery, just through the nature of the beast, right? And their whole, again, the whole reason of that is because it gets devalued. So you lend me money, you have to charge me interest in order for you to just even make your money back when I give it back. What that ends up doing to me is while I have the money, it's also getting devalued. And then I owe you more back of the money that's been devalued. So I'm worse off and you're really just getting your money back. And at the end of the day, we've now created debt. That's how all the fiat systems are always going to work. That's how anything besides Bitcoin is going to work. Now, alternatively, when you switch over to Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the complete opposite. And this is so beautiful. And this is the only technical thing I really am slightly confident on with Bitcoin is the reason why Bitcoin's the opposite of debt slavery is because the scarcity, the 21 million scarcity. You could print more fiat, you could debase metals and make more metal coins. You can't make more Bitcoin, the 21 million. And the key there is, and this blew my mind, and this is actually, when I understood this, this is what helped me liquidate everything I had and put it into Bitcoin. Because I had it in the back of my head, I thought, well, like, it's 21 million, but what's going to stop anybody from doing 21 million and one? Why can't, can't they just make more? Like, is this integrity? Where, where's the integrity? And then I realized that Bitcoin, the protocol is protected by proof of work. The scarcity is protected by proof of work. And then the proof of work is protected by the miners, the power of the miners. That's it. That's everything. There's this enormous hashing firewall that is making it to where, and this is a big thing because I had to overcome so many things, Robin, and I'm going all over the place with this, but I do know the original question we're talking about, the debt slavery between fiat and Bitcoin. But it's important to understand why Bitcoin scarcity is protected to understand why it's the opposite of, of debt slavery fiat because you have it relies everything on the fact that only 21 million that's everything that's everything to so the reason why it's not 
And the reason we can trust that is because the miners putting all that power in, all that hashing power, protecting that protocol. And that is why anyone that is worried about the power consumption that Bitcoin is doing, that's the reason you should love it. That's the reason you should love it because that's what's protecting the integrity of the scarcity. So now that we have the integrity of the scarcity, 21 million Bitcoin, now it's beautiful because it's the complete opposite of fiat and uh, anything metal because now the value goes up. Now you're not dealing with debasement or inflation through printing. Now, because you can't make any more, the value continues to go up on a long enough timeline. So this actually makes, this solves the crisis of lending. It's beautiful. Bitcoin is the answer to everything. I have to say this at one point, Ecclesiastes, he was this existential king in, uh, in the Old Testament. He, was, he did everything under the sun to his own words. He had one thing to say about money. He has the best definition for money. It should be the answer to everything. That's his standard of money. If you're using whatever you're using as money, it should be the answer to everything. So Bitcoin's the answer to this debt crisis because it solves the lending crisis. Because now, Robin, you lend me a Bitcoin. You don't need to charge me interest anymore because in the time that I have that Bitcoin, the value goes up on a long enough timeline. There's no way that that Bitcoin becomes less valuable. So you don't need to charge me interest. And by the time you get that Bitcoin back, as I lend it to you, it's either worth more or in the worst case, once we all, hey, it's been around 13, 14 years, it's only gone up. This integrity and belief system in Bitcoin is only going to get better as it continues to improve itself. Imagine lending 100 years from now where Bitcoin has proven itself and it's worth millions and millions of dollars if it's still even valued in fiat, which it probably will be. I think it'll, fiat will still be around. It's a great kind of pricing value for Bitcoin. But imagine once it has this like 100 year history of just only going up in value, you're, you're going to have no issue lending out your Bitcoin and then getting it back. It's a way more ethical and moral society and people won't need to go into debt anymore. And they'll be able to lend Bitcoin freely without having to charge interest. And one last thing I want to note about that, because I, I started learning when I learned about the Satoshis, so the problem also is why you have to print more fiat currency and metals is because you just need more of it to, to spur the economy, right? And another thought I had was, well, how can 21 million Bitcoin be enough for everybody? And it's because it's not just Bitcoin, it's, it's Satoshis, hundreds and millions of Satoshis, quadrillions of Satoshis. So really, you've got this quadrillions of Satoshis available. That's by far enough for everybody in, the, in our world. And then if you need more, you just move the decimal point over. It can go eight decimal points. And this is a thought process that would take like too much of our time. But all I'm saying is once you realize that you could just start moving the decimal points over, you can just logarithmically have more and more Satoshis available for people without devaluing it. It's more money than we could actually possibly dream about. It, it would take, and we'd have to colonize the whole galaxy, I think, to like max out the potential for Bitcoin to supply a society. Like it's, crazy how much of it is available in reality for us to use and never have to charge interest and none of us ever have to be in debt ever again using bitcoin that was long-winded and all over the place yeah it's really good I, I i love it a lot uh, i think the uh i don't know why the guests always apologize for ranting i think but but the, i think the ranting is the, the 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 cool stuff about the podcast like when 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 we just get into the rambling mode so i love it a lot uh, there, there was so many things in there um i think as the last point was really important to note because a lot of especially beginners to bitcoin are like oh but then there's only 21 million then like what's when all every, everything is sold like yeah when everything is sold the price will be going up into infinity basically when nobody wants to <laughs> sell any bitcoin uh, yeah. or spend any bitcoin then the price will go to infinity but before it will hit infinity some bitcoiner will be so freaking rich that he will buy an island will buy a supercar and then those sets get released again uh, and it doesn't matter how, what the amount of satoshis is because like if it's 21 million or 100 million or just a million satoshis that there are there and it's like quadrillions of satoshis that are available 21 million bitcoins yeah. so 
that that's that's a really great uh, point that you brought up and we can even the satoshis we can make micro satoshis we can yes. make under yes. satoshi another thing like we, we like it's it's software <laughs> we can do that yes. and this uh it, and it does not affect the overall supply it just divides uh one satoshi into many other things so like that's yes. that's a huge part that especially beginners cannot wrap their head around and i think that's uh, that's a very great point that you that you mentioned uh there thank you robin it's, also, it's a massive um, thought it's uh, a massive thought sorry absolutely. go ahead sir and <laughs> um, one thing that i was uh, cu curious uh, that that you saw uh, that you brought up was lending bitcoin because i think a lot about the lending market in bitcoin especially when you think of um what will bitcoiners do that have a lot of bitcoin but don't want to spend their bitcoin they, they rather when there's still a fiat currency but they rather lend the bitcoin out get some fiat for that and with pay with that fiat um some some bills that that's only possible as long as as fiat is still around but then there's also this scenario where uh, what happens if there's no longer fiat like um what, what are you are you even uh, able to lend out bitcoin and what do you get from that in return because as you said like bitcoin goes up uh forever or if bitcoin is a standard all the prices go down against bitcoin because then we measure everything in bitcoin so what would be my incentive to even lend out my bitcoin uh to give someone else like how, how do you think will uh the lending market will be affected in the in the medium term when fiat is still around and also maybe in the long term when maybe fiat is is not around anymore uh, do you have thoughts around that yes oh my god robin that's such a great question because you just unlocked one thing that i want to talk about and i didn't know how i was going to tie it in and i'm going to go for it now because that's that's a really good question and i don't have a technical answer but i have a an anthropology an, anthropological answer and a humanist answer to that so you know robin's question is is how how would lending work and i think let's just let's just say that we've reached a point where there's only bitcoin left and we're all dealing on the bitcoin standard and that's it and so what would be the incentive of robin lending me some of his bitcoin or vice versa and here's here's my answer to that and here's what i think that is the great hope with bitcoin for all of us so I'm going to go back. So I'm a biologist by trade and a, a poor one at that. But if you're a biologist, you also end up being an anthropologist. And one thing that's interesting that I've noticed that everyone is talking a lot. Everyone wants to like get away from the current society. Everyone, I speak from the American perspective because I've just I haven't traveled in a long time. So I've really just been in America for a good long while. And when you talk to an American, most Americans have this dream to just return to the hunter gatherer lifestyle. They all want to like move out into the middle of the woods with just their small little clan and just like live off the land and just be away from what they consider this toxic society, which has become incredibly anti-humanist and incredibly selfish and incredibly greedy. And God knows that I'm a part of that and that I've played into that myself. So certainly I need to do a lot of self-reflection on that. But specifically what has happened is, you know, we have a greedy, toxic society that is, and you nailed it when you said, you know, why, why lend anything? What's in it for me? So really quick, I want to go back to how humans first started interacting with one another. And this will tie into answering this. Barter was never really a big thing. Barter was never really actually a big thing. The first money that was almost perfect it was almost as good as Bitcoin was something called social capital. That was humans first money. So when humans were, became homo sapiens about three, 400,000 years ago, we lived the hunter gatherer lifestyle for a few hundred thousand years. And barter was very rarely used because it wasn't efficient. It was social capital was the form of money that hunter gatherers used. And here's how it worked. And this is beautiful because this is essentially a lending economy. I'm a bow maker. Robin's an arrow maker. All right. Our money is social capital. Now I need some arrows. So I go over to Robin. I'm like, Robin, I need some arrows. Now we're not doing barter because Robin already has a bow. So it, it wouldn't make sense for him to take a bow that I have at that time. 
because one important thing about the hunter gatherer community is let's say we have 150 members. We need every member doing well. We need it because every member and here's their proof of work is food. We need every member gathering food, whatever it takes. We got to make sure everyone's gathering food. That's our Bitcoin's proof of work, essentially. That's holding our integrity together. So Robin's going to lend me the arrows, but not take the bow because he doesn't need it. Somebody else might need it. So he's just going to go ahead and lend me those arrows based on the social capital that when I go and I use those arrows and get a kill, I'm going to share the meat with him. And that is the idea of the hunter gatherer lending is the fact that he knows he can give me those bows and arrows off of just the fact that though in that moment, he's not getting anything from it. Eventually he's going to get the meat from the arrows I produced and further on down the road, if his bow does break and now he comes over to me, I'm going to give him the bow because he gave me the arrows earlier. So you just have this perfect lending economy that's seated in social capital, meaning we all have integrity. We trust each other that in the long run, by giving me the arrows and helping me do better, Robin's going to do better because he's going to see that meat get returned or he's going to get a bow later on. And what's even more beautiful about that is the, the integrity that holds social capital together is if somebody doesn't honor that, and Bitcoin's cool, an analogy to this, because if somebody messes with Bitcoin, the whole network knows immediately, right? It's all tied together through proof of work. So you can't manipulate it without getting called out. If I take the arrows and I get a kill, but I don't share the meat, and Robin finds out about that, and then he comes and wants to get a bow for me and I don't give it, and then now that all the hunter gatherers are saying, well, what's going on here? Why aren't you giving him the bow? And they find out it's because I'm not sharing. It's like the proof of work has been called out. I've manipulated the system. I get called out by the community. And now I have to give Robin the bow and it returns things to the natural order. So this money that was social capital was perfect. It lasted for hundreds and thousands of years perfectly so well that humans multiplied to the point where they took over the whole earth. And we started having to do agriculture because we needed more calories out of small amounts of land. So one where social capital failed was it failed to scale. It couldn't scale. Once you started having societies bigger than 150, that proof of work, the money and the, uh, the I'm sorry, the, uh, the trust and the integrity between one another, you couldn't know everybody in your community past 150. So social capital went away and now we didn't need to share food anymore. And now this brought in the use of coins, seashells, things that we could use as a medium of exchange as strangers, and then kicked off the process of the greed and essentially wanting interest and what's in it for me when I give you this money because I know that I'm never going to see you again. I know that I'm not getting any food from you. I know that I'm not going to get any goods and services from you. So I need to get something for this money I'm lending you. So social capital failed to scale and it, and the system has been imperfect ever since and built on on greed and toxicity of what can I get? I think that the answer to the question, Robin, of how Bitcoin will send, solve the lending crisis and how people will lend their Bitcoin based on social capital is because under the Bitcoin standard, and this is going to take a long time, I, I'll probably, we, you and I might both be dead before this takes place because you just need all the old guard to be gone. And the human race that's operating entirely off the Bitcoin standard, experiencing the abundance that it provides. And this goes back to what we were just talking about, how once somebody realizes how much abundance Bitcoin really is, when you bust it down to the quadrillions of Satoshis, the almost infinite amount of decimal, it's crazy abundance. Once the human race is living off that level of abundance, I think it will return to social capital in the sense that we'll all be tied together by our currency. Because right now, none of us have any allegiance to each other over currency. You're dealing in your currency that you deal in in Austria. I deal in the currency I'm in America. There's hundreds, thousands of different currencies. We have no allegiance to one another. There's no proof of work. There's no integrity with our currency. Imagine everyone using the same currency, experiencing no, no only abundance, only abundance. And now the human mind is no longer in this rat race. Imagine every human being is no longer in this rat race, scarce mindset of like, like, I'm so greedy, Robin, because I'm desperate because I'm in so much debt. 
I'm like, if I lend you something, I need something back because I'm like starving, right? I'm in this desperate, scarce mindset that I need something back immediately if I lend you something. You give me abundance and you give every other human being abundance, which is what Bitcoin is. Now the lending process becomes like, oh my God, you need more Bitcoin because you need some Bitcoin to fuel a project that, I mean, in the future, imagine human innovation in the future with AI and whatnot. We're going to be doing things that we can't even possibly imagine. I mean, teaching, I teach high school science and even the, the kids that I teach that are 10, 20 years younger than me, they're already thinking of ways to, they want to visit black holes. They want to build structures around, they're thinking in space. They're thinking in solar system terms, galaxy terms. They want to invent wormhole technology. They want, it's like, we don't have time to be greedy about money anymore. We need it now. Every human being, just like, I want to bring it home, just like the reason why everybody wants to go live out on their own is that they're just craving that social capital again, that everybody wants everybody to do well again. Cause like the, like the hunter gatherer tribe originally, like how we're geared and evolved to be because we spent hundreds and thousands of years in that abundant mindset, helping one another. Bitcoin, I believe will return us to that. It will return us to that social capital integrity where it's like, Robin, I may never even have met you in my life, but if we're completely on the Bitcoin standard and for whatever reason, you need me to lend you some of my Bitcoin so you could work on your project to propel the human race forward. And we're back in that social capital mindset. And I understand the abundance that Bitcoin's giving. I'm giving you that Bitcoin. I'm giving you that Bitcoin because the proverbial meat's going to come back to me because whatever technology you discover using that or whatever advancement you, you uh, accomplish using that Bitcoin I give you will ultimately benefit me. It'll come back around to me sometime. So that's how I see it taking care of this lending crisis. I think it's, it's, it is naive. It is a uh, humanist to the core, but it's the only way I see us overcoming uh, the greed and toxicity with one another. And just going back to that, that instinctual evolutionarily tie that we all have to one another, that we all want each other to do well. Bitcoin's our only hope. It's the only money that could possibly bring us to that level of enlightenment enlightenment robin if you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis i guess you already bought some bitcoin and now the most important step is to keep the bitcoin keep them secure in a hardware wallet my personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the bitbox it's super secure it's simple to set up it's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the bitcoin on an exchange and you can get a five percent discount with the code robin at the checkout Visit bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship setup, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin, you get a 30-minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for those amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. That's uh, That was amazing. Amazing. I love it. Um, <laughs> that sounded it, like I was a madman. The, the, yeah. <laughs> I, I love it a lot. Like uh, I think uh, I think it's a long way out till this happens. Uh, but you mentioned that, and I think it's 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 great. Uh, 
how how far you are think and and how great that world could actually look like and i think you mentioned it also before with like the connection from bitcoin and you say now enlightenment with religion uh and you said like there's a strong connection as you see it with bitcoin and religion uh where do you see that religion i had i think I had uh, the the deepest podcast we did on this podcast was with Pastor Coin, where we talked about uh, Bitcoin and the Bible. Uh, I don't know if you saw that one, uh, but did you? Um, uh, what, where is this connection for you between uh, church, uh, religion, God, and and Bitcoin? Robin, thank you so much for allowing me to go into this. So, I have one particular story that really stood out to me, and I'm all about the when it comes to Religion, I just love, I love the stories. I love the stories and I love the analogies because to me, somebody took the time to wrote it down. Somebody took the time to protect it for thousands of years so we could have it. So, I mean, I think you could be a, a total, um, you know, Nietzsche nihilist and, and read the religious text, whether it's the Bible or the Quran or anything you want of the 10,000 religions and get something from it because it must have some value if somebody wrote it down and protected it. Me personally, most likely because I'm just a Westerner. I read the Bible for my analogies and my metaphors and my wisdom. And I do have uh, several stories that, that I like with Bitcoin, but one in particular is the David and Goliath story. I love the David and Goliath story for the, the, the Bitcoin story because we're both, you're both characters. We're both characters. And I want to break down first the character of uh, Goliath. So Goliath is really interesting because he's this like big dude, six foot for back in his day. And what stood out to me when I was reading his story and I was like, oh, that's like kind of Bitcoin is his armor. Uh, they call it. So back then their money was shekels. And in his time, the shekel was made of bronze. And what these warriors would do is every time they survived a campaign, they'd get paid in shekels and then they'd melt the shekels down and they'd add it to their armor. So Goliath was notable on the battlefield because he'd survived so many battles and campaigns that his armor was like 600 shekels. That was the value of it. He had full head to toe, thick bronze armor because every time he survived a campaign, which I was thinking, it's like every time you make it through another having, every time you go four years, if you buy Bitcoin and you go four years, you're adding to your, your wealth, your armor, just like Goliath. I mean, he... He, he lasted so many uh, halvings that by the time he was, you know, getting ready to uh, face off with David, he was just armored to the to the neck to toe. In fact, the only thing you could see was his eyes, which David took advantage of. But that really stood out to me because I thought, wow, we all have the opportunity to be Goliath here. If you get some Bitcoin, no matter what it is, no matter how much it is, it doesn't matter because it's only going up on a long enough timeline. And then you survive that first cycle. And you survive that first four years of having, you hold on to it. It's just like, it's just going to keep growing that arm. You're going to feel empowered. And then another four years, look at all the OGs that you have come onto this podcast who are most of them. They're just doing what they love. Uh, you had that comic book writer on the other day. He's like, just enjoying doing his comics because his Bitcoin armor is so powerful at this point because he's waited it out. And you know, these OGs, you got to give them credit. It's like they bought and they held. And they, they played the game 10 years, 10, all the whole time. They, they've survived. They're the true original warriors. They're the Goliaths because they withstood the campaigns in order to have that, that armor like Goliath had. And now they get to do what they love and uh, uh, with their armor on. So that character really stood out to me as a Bitcoiner because if you, if you want to become Goliath, buy some Bitcoin and then just weather the, weather the battles, weather the, weather the storms, whether the havings, whether the volatility, and eventually you're going to be that warrior out on the battlefield who everybody's looking at, who everybody's like, oh my God, look at that, that awesome, that badass, you know, you're going to be a badass. So I love that character from the Bible. And I, he, he's basically a, he's a shekeler, you know, you're a Bitcoiner, that you're the same. You're just going to only grow in power and empowerment. And then alternatively, uh, going over to the other side of that story, David, you know, I love the story of David because he's basically, he's a guy that comes from nothing. He's nothing. He's the youngest son of a shepherd. And the shepherd, you know, in the Bible, everybody gets this awesome name. It's like his dad's name is Jesse. He just gets this little simple name. And he's the youngest son of Jesse. 
He doesn't even get to join the military. That's how low prestige he is, how low prestige he is. The only reason he enters the story is he's bringing food to his brothers on the front line. And while he's on the front line, he sees that there's this guy, Goliath, coming out every day and challenging all the Israelites to a one-on-one. And if they could beat him, it'll determine the war. And all these Israelites are cowering in fear. They're scared. It's a story of fear, Robin. So the thing is, there's so many people right now that want to buy Bitcoin, but they're they're afraid. They're afraid because it's a war, because there's a lot of volatility, because it's going to take time. And so the word here is David is a story of what's called conviction, because David shows up to the battle and he sees that all the Israelites are scared of Goliath. And he sees that none of them want to go out and fight him because they know if they lose, they lose the war. Because back then, a one-on-one meant if you did a one-on-one, whoever won, that side won. So you were risking your whole nation if you took the fight. So David, he sees his opportunity, just like so many people right now have an opportunity to actually buy a significant amount of Bitcoin. You've had so many people on that have made it abundantly clear that even if you're just 0.01, 0.1, 0.001, there's no better time than right now to take that, to go out onto that battlefield, have some conviction and buy it. But you literally have to have a conviction, the level of David's, because when David overcame that fear, he did it. He went all in. He went all in. He saw his opportunity. He went to the king. He requested that one V one. The king was like, no way, no way. But David was like, trust me, I will beat this guy. I'm convicted. I'll go out there. I'll kill him. You can believe in me. I'm going to go out on this 100%. He put his very life on it to go out to have a chance. And the reason he did it, Robin, and so many people I think can relate to this is because so many of us, we're nothing. We have nothing. We're so in debt. We're, we're living with so much scarce financial scarcity. You have to be David. You have to go out and take a big chance. You have to, and you're going to feel fear. If you didn't feel fear, it's probably the wrong direction. It's probably the wrong direction. And you're going to have to have conviction like David had. And sure enough, you know, he goes out there and risks, he puts his nation on the line. He puts his life on the line. He puts his family's honor on the line. He put everything on the line and he won. And he won because he overcame his fear and he went all in. And what's beautiful about him is just like Bitcoin, he wins that fight. But if anybody who ever wants to read the story of David from the bot, it goes on for like the next 40 years. It takes him another 40 years after he wins that fight to fully see the fruitation of his victory. So it's a combination of, it's, it's just pure conviction. So you need to be David if you're going in to be a Bitcoiner. You have to just go into it knowing that this is a, a journey that's going to last the rest of your life because that's what it's going to take to see it all play out. And if you do it though, just like David, you'll go from a shepherd, the lowest of low, the youngest of a shepherd's son, nothing to the greatest king of all time. If you just have that, conviction and conviction comes from education. You have to watch all of Robin's videos. You got to watch all of everybody's videos. That's what it took for me to hold on to my Bitcoin. That's what it takes, you know, what the reason I love, uh, I love you, Robin is because I need that conviction every day. That's why I like your podcast. Cause you're every day. If I could, if I watch one of your videos every day, I'm like, it keeps my conviction strong. And that's, that's all you need. You just need that conviction to just keep going. So Be Goliath, buy your Bitcoin to empower yourself and be that David knowing that overcome that fear, get your Bitcoin and then embark on your your journey to become king or queen. You know, even for you ladies out there, it applies to both. That's just one story, Robin. Amazing. Amazing. Well, that, that, that story is really good. And I wanted to say it later, but I think I, I will say it even now. I think you are a really good speaker and you're, you're a great guest already. Uh, and it's uh, it honors me that you chose my podcast as, as uh, to be uh, the first podcast you, you air on. Uh, and I hope and I think uh, you will be on many more podcasts. And uh, I think you started also your own uh, YouTube channel. And I think you you should expand on that and take all those small stories that you you tell here, maybe expand on them, take them out and, and like do a video every week or something like that. I think that would be a great hit. And uh, I wish you already uh, a really good thing with that because I, th- those stories are genuinely uh, interesting. 
like th that, that are not just, uh, and I have a Bitcoin conversation every day. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, like for, for me to be something and interesting, like it, it just has to be something unique and different. Uh, and so like, that's something really cool. I never heard the David and Goliath story like that related to Bitcoin. And I think you have many more of them, uh, that would, uh, be just too many for for this, that one podcast. So I think you have a great you have a great way to expand on that in in your own channels, and uh, and would love to to see that and and you thriving on 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 YouTube and on other platforms. That that would be great for me to see. Gosh, thank you so much, Rob, and that means a lot. Appreciate that. I'm honored to be here. The the pleasure is all mine. You're the man. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, the daily podcast is 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 the best thing uh, you can do. It like the, every day, uh, having the conviction and, and putting out something. It's uh, it's a full time job, but it's uh, something that I love to do every day. It's it's Saturday evening, and I would not uh, like to do anything else. Honestly, it's it's so great to do exactly that what I'm doing. But back to the story. Um, when we come now to uh, David and Goliath, and we model this story a little bit differently and we say that david is, is is bitcoin that tries to bring that goliath down and the goliath is kind of that 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 fiat system um how long do you think if at all will that take like i think you already uh, spoiled it, that you you think that the fiat system will go away and then we come to that bitcoin system where this 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 world is thing but do you have somewhere like okay this this takes five years this takes 100 years like do, do you have some rough estimate where you're like th that's the time frame you you think of how, how long it will take obviously it's a very speculative uh, question but uh, it, it's it's fun to to talk about yeah, it really is. It really is. And it's it's a great question, Robin. And it's it's very ambiguous for sure because, you know, I think, uh, well, you know what? I got to go back to uh, Ray Dalio's Changing World Order book because essentially what he pointed out is civilizations go through six phases, basically. And I won't touch up on any of the phases because I would actually need to go read the book. But we're in what's called phase five of six which is verge of revolution phase, verge of revolution phase. And if you never do read, uh, if, if anyone out there never does read Changing World Order, basically what it is is that Ray Dalio is a, a multi-billionaire who uses AI to just analyze tens of thousands of civilizations, the rise and falls of civilizations. And he got some very good data that just applies to all of them. So what it would take for... Bitcoin to replace fiat is a revolution, a full-blown revolution. Now, revolutions are one or the other. They're peaceful revolutions or they're violent revolutions. Now, the majority of revolutions, again, based on Ray Dalio's research, are violent revolutions. M most of them, a higher percentage are violent revolutions. A small percentage of them are peaceful revolutions, like Gandhi. Gandhi's India Revolution would be an example of a peaceful revolution. They're hard to pull off. Most of them are violent, like the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia in 1917. And God, you're in an area of Europe, Robin, you know more about the theme. Violent revolutions all over in Europe. I mean, look at most of them were violent, right? What it would take, and we're in phase five. So when you're looking at timelines, one thing that Ray Dalio has discovered is phase five can last anywhere from tomorrow to two, about 200 years. That's what he's seen. Zero to 200 years before a revolution on a scale that can overturn a world order takes place. So that seems like a long time for you and I and any one human because our lifespan is here in the United States, 70s. So it would seem like a long time. But all of us are educated enough now to know that 70 years is nothing. 200 years is nothing. So, you know, for for Bitcoin to topple the fiat currency, you would need the fiat system to just essentially completely fail through revolution, most likely violent revolution. So really it's how many, how close are we to, this is a tough one, Robin, because, you know, and I don't uh, even talk about this, but I am an Iraqi war veteran, uh, former U.S. Marine. And when you've seen a war, you don't wish it 
on anyone or anything. And so you never want, this is a tough one because as much as you want the Bitcoin standard and you realize, gosh, you almost get, I feel almost emotional about it because it's like, you want it so bad. You want the Bitcoin standard and everything we talked about earlier, that utopian world of abundance and social capital to happen. But deep down, you know that it's gonna take a lot of violence for it to happen, most likely, and a violent revolution for it to happen. So it's like a juxtaposition to say, well, God, I want it tomorrow, but I know what that means. I know what that means is it's gonna take a revolution for it to happen. So, but that's just getting too emotional in it. All emotions aside, um, and just being calculated about this, I see, I see a revolution. If I was saying, if I just had to go for it, probably in the next 30, maybe I'd give it 40, 50 years. I'd give it 40, 50 years max before. I mean, we can't, it could happen tomorrow, but I think at most, at most this system we're in right now, um, you know the game Cyberpunk 2077? That's a perfect timeline. I think by 2077, 2077, this thing goes down. 50 years. This thing can't last more than 50 years, Ron. It can't go for more than 50 years like it is now. There's no way. And then it's either going to be peaceful revolution or violent. And it just is what it is. And then whoever's left afterwards, if it's peaceful, a lot of us. If it's violent, just a few. More Bitcoin for, for just a few, I guess. But then, then Bitcoin will be, the Bitcoin standard will arise. It'll, it'll be the, it's the only way it'll be the money that's left because everything else will be gone. It'll just be the Bitcoin that's left after that revolution. And then that's all, then we'll be good. You just have to survive it. That, 50 years, 50 years. That's such an interesting, that's such an interesting topic because when you think of other, uh, technical advancements and, uh, Bitcoin replacing fiat is way more than a technical advancement. It's a revolution, as you said, uh, because you have to, uh, it's also a turn to power and, and, and way more things. But if you purely look at technical advancements, like from the horse to the car, it took a long time. Like it took like 30, 40 years to really take like mass market. And there's still people riding on horses. <laughs> yeah. still that ho horses as as a as a means of transport is still there even like a hundred years later even though we have the car for so long and we know a motorcycle is way more efficient than a horse uh yes. but a horse is still around and they they still do it more for like uh, other reasons than just coming around but yeah uh so it, it will be interesting to see how great this network effect of fear is because there's this thing where like does the uh, current system cling on to the power of the fiat system or do they realize that they have to adopt now bitcoin as fast as possible otherwise they might fight the war and stand on the other side of the war and don't have anything they just have the fiat money so like I think we will probably come to a point where at some point all the greatest world forces will fight for as many Satoshis as they can get. Like uh, this, this game theory will definitely play on. I hope it will be uh, peaceful. That's why I always advocate for self-custody as much as possible. Um, uh, and I think it's it, it will be a great world. But the transition period could be interesting and could not be peaceful. Yeah. Um, on the other side, it will be amazing. Uh, and for us, it will be very interesting in the next 50 to 100 years. So I, yes. I'm now 25. So in 50 years, I'm 75. So yes. my whole life probably will be within this transition phase. And yes, I will uh, document everything on my podcast till I die. <laughs> so it yes. will be very interesting uh, to have uh, my my life basically as a documentary with all those amazing people and guests that I speak on. And I want to expand, like I want to really like just travel to El Salvador, travel to Nigeria, and travel to those places where the adoption is already high and really make documentaries around that and interview people on the ground uh, and do those types of contents also. But that's like a 
a, a sneak preview maybe for for next year or next to next year for my channel that that will be a, a later project will not happen this year um and uh i think i think it will be amazing to see and amazing to watch one last um uh question that i have for you today is what did bitcoin already do for your personal uh freedom as you uh came from a debt feared slave world uh you still have that but you already have uh bitcoin so how 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 much did bitcoin do to your personal freedom and how much more free do you feel in in general great question robin i gotta tell you i feel so much better you know uh, a big issue here in the united states is mental illness because a lot of us have a lot of despair of the future and we don't feel like we have hope in the future. And just having all of that being replaced with hope and joy has just so freed up so much uh, mental angst for me, knowing that I have a light at the end of the tunnel and knowing that, hey, in my lifetime, if I have to play the fiat game and exchange some of my Bitcoin for fiat here and there in order to just get the system off my back, get these loans off my back, my mortgage off my back, my student loans off my back, just to just leave me alone. And the fact that I know that the Bitcoin I have on a long enough timeline, and this is what's beautiful for, we're talking, but we, our conversation was just taken into effect 50, 100 years, right? But hey, I mean, this kid, when you're looking at it just within the system we're in now, there could be huge results just come the end of this year. I mean, Robin, maybe at the end of this year, I'm I'm out of my debt slave crisis. It seriously could come that fast. I mean, this thing, once it takes off for its second big run, I mean, we're looking at potentially some big numbers. And all of us who are holding right now, you know, then we're going to be the second generation OGs who are just doing exactly what we love and whatnot. So what it's done for me in the immediate is really a lot of, it's just taken a huge weight off my shoulders. It's taken, it's freed up a lot of my brain power because I no longer need to be using that on my financial life. It actually has made me a better teacher. It's made me a better husband. It's made me a better father because now I'm using all my brain power for what I love to do. And I'm just letting Bitcoin take care of all of my finances. And it's, and the volatility is just the volatility. I just need, I just know hodl, right? I'm a hodler. So we're good to go. And furthermore, I think, you know, this conversation is made when you have children, when you have children, you just instinctively, you want to be able to give them something that will matter. And one thing that was like really a, was hurting me was thinking that I didn't have anything that I was going to be able to leave my children whenever it is that I'm gone. And this is where I love self custody because it's like, I'm putting a portion of Bitcoin somewhere stacked far away. It's theirs, put it on my bit box, put it in a, in a lock. And I just like the thought of one day being able to hand my children their Bitcoin because I can't even imagine what they're going to do with it. You've had so many guests that I'm a dinosaur. I look at Bitcoin financially. You've got guests that are using it to, it's the it, Ecclesiastes, it should be the answer to everything. I'm at peace knowing that Bitcoin is the answer to everything. It actually solved Ecclesiastes' existential question. He didn't get to see it in his time and he was actually kind of a depressed guy. I don't have to be that. I know that God only knows what my children are gonna do with Bitcoin. God only know what, what's possible with it. It's wonderful to be able to have something that is valuable to pass on to my children. It's wonderful to have something that any day now will just completely free me from my fiat debt slave status. And there will that day will come, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's 10 years from now, whether it's 20 years from now. I'm fortunate, I'm, I'm 37. I plan to live to be 150, darn it. So I know it's gonna happen. So it's just tons of hope, Robin. It's tons of hope in, in, the, in the short, mid and long term. It's just an enormous amount of hope, which brings a lot of joy, which has really uh, made me mentally happy, not mentally ill. It's brought me a lot of happiness. And that means a lot to me. I, I, I love Satoshi. I love Bitcoin. And I love my fellow Bitcoiners. And I just want to stretch this out one more thing on the mental health is, and this is because I'm a teacher, you know, I have, I teach science. So STEM 
is in trouble. STEM is science, technical, engineering, mathematics. So many young people right now in the United States are just depressed. They have, they have no hope for their future. They have nowhere to put all their intellectual power. They have no community. They have no community of friends and things they care about. And again, Bitcoin is the answer to everything. Get these, I tell all my students, this is not financial advice. This is just advice to help you get some Bitcoin. Take a hundred bucks and buy some Bitcoin just so you have it. It's giving an outlet. Because this, this is a big part of what Bitcoin is doing for me to still answer your question. It's improving the lives of the people around me. Because especially these young people, right? We have young people who are in America who are shooting people, who are being violent, who are so hopeless that they're killing people, killing themselves. And they need an outlet. And Bitcoin gives them that. It gives them a reason to be a scientist. It gives them a reason to be, get into tech, into engineering, into mathematics. You've had so many young people come on your podcast, Robin, with innovations that blow my mind from mining equipment in your house to election in integrity uh, systems to more things than I could even, I have to go through and watch your whole library again, just to remember all the innovations. And that's just what, a year? And it's just going to keep being used for more and more. And then most importantly, it's community. I'm a guy who, if I'm not teaching and I'm not with my family, I just like to be alone. But I started watching your podcast and I like had to reach out to you because I just was like, I need this community. It just brings out this sense in community. I would have never thought to reach out to anyone on YouTube ever and try and actually have a conversation with them. But Bitcoin provides us with such a community. I like had to talk to you because just you being a Bitcoiner, Robin, I'm already like, we're good. I run into somebody out on the streets. They could be at the opposite of me in every which way. And that's fine. But they own some Bitcoin. It's like we're a community instantly. Bitcoiners are just, it's the best community. It's full of just hopeful, intelligent, innovative, loving, kind, interesting people. And that is just the greatest thing to see being somebody who is essentially uh, all in on, you know, I'm not one of the kind of people that wants to go live by myself out in the middle of the woods. I, I want a society. I want to love the people that I'm in society with. I want to see my society thrive. I want to see us all have a common bond. And uh, Bitcoin is the answer to that. That's what it's done for me. That's so beautiful. Uh, I, I loved it a lot, uh, Derek. That was, that, that was really cool. Um, just a quick, uh, saying about, uh, meeting other Bitcoiners. I think that's a great possibility meeting other Bitcoiners in real life, having those conversations. Yeah. I don't like Zoom, just Google Meets is great, but actually going to a local Bitcoin meetup, actually going to, yeah, yes. Bitcoin conference, like Bitcoin Prague uh, is, is one of my favorites because it's just like there are all, everyone is there. And it's for me just like four days that are blocked in my calendar. And now I'm like uh, up from five in the morning to like midnight. And I just go and meet as many Bitcoiners as possible because that's, I get from those four days more energy than like from the rest of the year uh, yeah. for, uh, as, a, as a feeling. Like it's it's so amazing to meet the, those Bitcoiners online. Uh, just a quick uh, service announcement. If you plan to go to next year's Bitcoin Prague conference, which is uh, a long way out, but uh, because the, the last one was uh, like just two months ago, but there are now really cheap t tickets out there and you can... Uh, also use code Robin again. They are not a sponsor of this podcast, uh, but I just love connecting people. And I saw the magic happening in Bitcoin Prague. And if I can facilitate that in any way, shape or form, I happily do that. And uh, I think like the tickets, I have to look at by they're, they're like really cheap in, in, the, in, in the early days now. And then they just get a little bit uh, more expensive then. And if you could use just code Robin, then you get even more... Off. But yeah, uh, from that, uh, I think meeting other Bitcoiners is amazing and it's so important to do. One one more uh, question that I just thought about, um, you brought up mental health issue. And I think that's something that I don't speak 
enough about on my podcast. Uh, and I'm thankful that you brought it up because it's a really interesting uh, thing that we have to discuss. Do you think that most of that comes from the fiat system or is like also a big part of mental health issue? Yeah, we're just humans and we will always have those and it's it's hard to be a human <laughs> kind of, uh, or is, is that uh, a lot of those issues actually come from fiat and from uh, a system that is stealing from us and because it's stealing from us, we don't trust each other then anymore and, and losing those personal connections? Yeah, that's a great question, Robin. And that's, yeah, that's heavy because the, the root cause is certainly a lack of purpose. That's where mental illness comes from. It's a lack of purpose. You always have to go to the root cause. And then you got to look at what's causing the symptoms, right? And absolutely, where we're at right now in the fiat system is a cause of those symptoms because ultimately where we're at in the fiat system is it's taking away opportunity now because the wealth gap and this, again, it just happens. It happens in every fiat system cycle. And then it restarts and then you get more opportunity. You know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if we were living in, say, post-World War II America fiat system. This would be like, oh, my God, we're in the greatest times ever. Like, God bless fiat. This is amazing. All of us have jobs. No one had hardly anyone unless you were. I mean, the fact that World War II veterans who saw the most horrible, vicious things could come back and relatively make it through life with not as nearly as many mental illnesses as we have right now. It tells you how much better off they were. But the cycle that we're in right now in the fiat system is taking away opportunity for the majority of people to do what they love because either they don't have access to education in order to get to the place they want to be, or in order to get that education, they have to become a debt slave and then have that financial burden hovering over their head. And because people aren't able through financial means to do what they love, then they're missing out on what their God's calling is and they're calling to do their purpose. And therefore, absolutely, if you don't have the financial means, then you certainly have less opportunity to do what you love. And that 100% contributes enormously to mental illness. I'm sure and I, this isn't something, you know, you asked a great credit and this is just, I'm just free, just kind of free flowing now is I bet if you did do an in-depth study, you would certainly find that as the wealth gap increases, the level of mental illness rises because we certainly have an increasing wealth gap that just happens to most certainly without even reading anything correlate to an increase in mental illness. So you have to, you do have to put some blame on the fiat currency, certainly some blame too on just the breakdown of God, I guess it always does tie into the fiat because it's the breakdown of family. You know, a lot of my students don't have a family uh, and the biggest reason families break up money, financial stress breaks apart most families. And then that just stems from there. So yeah, the more I kind of work this out while I'm talking about it, after you ask that question, it, it is, it is, it is the issue with the fiat system that people have mental illness. It's a huge issue. Absolutely. 100% Robin, because it's, it's not providing people the financial stability. They need to be the best version of themselves. It's just not providing. People it it the, has a great yeah, thing no. to do with it. Absolutely. Very true. Um, as you know, my end routine, uh, when you watch my videos is like two questions and one question is always the same for everyone, my guests. Um, what can we learn from you besides Bitcoin and all the things that we already talked about on the podcast? Yeah, I was looking forward to this one. I love this one. And keep it super simple. Go out and have access to nature. Get away from all of this. All of this. Have a place where you could get away from all of this. Have it right where you live. I say, and there's a lot of ways this looks like. For me, it's my backyard. That's my place I go out and I grow my plants and I watch the birds and I watch the bees pollinate the flowers that I grow. And I just sit back there and I don't even think about anything other than just, this is nature. And this is just have a place to get away from all of this. Even, even Bitcoin, take a break, have a place to just take a break from everything where you could just be nothing. And the way I do that is by just creating a, a piece of nature close by. I know people who they put house plants, 
if you're living in like a condo or an apartment, have a portion of your little condo or your studio. I used to live in a 500 square foot studio for a long time with my wife, just my wife and I, we had a little corner, just a little nature corner, just go there, sit with the plants and just take a break, be nothing, leave your cell phone, turn off everything and just go have a place that you could be where you're nothing and just be a part of nature. Even if it's just a house plant in you in the corner of a room, I'm very blessed. I get to go into a backyard and grow plants and just sit there and watch the ants and the bees and the, and the other animals that aren't us. Cause we're just one tiny little speck of this world. It's not all about us. It's actually very little about us go and watch what it's all about, what everything else is doing and just be nothing. And when you come back from that, you feel so refreshed. So take a break from all this and have a place where you could go be nothing and just watch what else is going on out there. That's not, that has anything to do with humans. Go watch what the bees and the birds and the plants are doing. Cause they're true. They're so That's true. beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, man. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. It helps me a lot. I love it a lot. And I, it helps I, me a lot. I love that a lot. Uh, it, it's, it's truly beautiful. Um, now let's come to the actual end routine uh, where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest uh, actually is. Um, and your question is an interesting one. Um, I, I will explain a little bit um, before the question. Uh, usually um, when, when we want the free market and we go to the extreme of the free market, we don't want to have any central authority saying to us anything uh, about what they want or how it should be. So the free market should take care of everything. So that would also mean that the government services like servicing the streets, uh, making hospitals, uh, and, and, and guarding the, the streets and have a monopoly on violence and all those things that now it's kind of in every country the the, the case. Um, is it possible? Uh, can we put all those government services to the free market, or is there always a place for a centralized authority to have maybe hospitals, maybe other things uh, in their power, or can we have this free market where everything is in in private hands? That is a good question. That's a powerful question. I'm so happy that earlier we, I, I would have been stumped on this question if we didn't talk earlier about the social capital with hunter gatherers and how potentially in the future, Bitcoin becomes our new system of proof of work and, and social capitalism. So there's this interesting philosophy that, so on, to answer that question, as it stands right now, if we maintain the fiat currency, there will always need to be central government collecting some form of taxes, regulating, building the roads, making sure people aren't doing horrible things to one another financially, physically. You can't get over that. You will need central government under our current system and the fiat system because it's a system of greed and, and power hungry and what's in it for me, not for you. When you have that, oh, you need central authority. That's why it exists, right? It's filling a certain power vacuum. So if it stays that way forever, then the answer to that question is yes, you will always need some form of central authority collecting some resources from everyone because they're going to just refuse to give it up if someone doesn't just take it. So we can have schools, police, fire, roads, whatnot. Now, in this future utopia that we kind of looked at a little bit earlier, where honestly, the word anarchy comes to mind. And I learned this from my psychology teacher and because I, when I was younger, I was uh, a bit of a ruffian and I like the thought of anarchy because when you're 15 or 16, you just have a lot of testosterone. You want to go out and go metal on the world. But I remember my psychology teacher one day, he's a really, really wise man. He took me aside. He goes, you know what anarchy really is, right? And I said, I said, no, it's going around and just being kind of chaotic evil, right? He said, no, it's the complete opposite. It's the complete opposite. Anarchy is a state when every human being is given the ultimate freedom of liberty and they choose to be the most righteous, loving, kind people with that love, liberty and freedom. That's anarchy. That's the philosophy of anarchy is when the humankind can reach that point. That's true anarchy. That's I think the closest country to that is like Sweden, for instance. They're supposedly like social anarchists 
right? They just look out for one another. The Swedish just give and give and give to one another so they could just create this society of abundance. I probably shouldn't even go there because I don't know a lot about geopolitics in that area. But the answer to that question is we can remove central authority if we adopt the idea that each and every one of us is that idealistic anarchist, that each one of us can have as much freedom and liberty as we want so long as we make the choice to be the most loving, kind, giving people. And that only happens under the Bitcoin standard for all the reasons we talked about earlier. The fact that there's so much abundance with it. Because then you don't need a central authority going around regulating everything. Because if I need a road built outside of my house, I'm going to do everything individually possible to make it happen. And if that crew says they need some of my Bitcoin to make it happen, take some. I want the road. I'm happy to give it. We don't need a central authority. We don't need any more regulation than just me and whoever's building my road. If someone's teaching my children, what do you need from me to teach my children? I'm happy to give it. Because again, in a social capital world, a Bitcoin integrity world, we all know that what you give, you get right back. Because you can't manipulate that. Just like you can't manipulate Bitcoin. You can't manipulate perfect social credit perfect social capital. So that's an interesting question and it could go both ways. No, no, under the certain current system, no. You will need central authority. Under a pure Bitcoin standard, and God, it'd be beautiful to live to see that day, Robert, and I hope to I'm gonna eat healthy and exercise. Yes, we could have no longer any central authority if we're under a Bitcoin standard, under a social capital standard, under an integrity standard, because then we're all just wanting what's best for one another. And we're all willing to just give, 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 because we know it's just going to keep so much will come back that you'll have to give. Like you just said earlier, when you said the Bitcoin standard works because people just get so abundant, they have to go give it away. Here, just take it. Sure, I'll take a yacht in return. Sure, I'll take this. Like you have to give under a system that's so abundant. You have no other choice. You have so much. That's the Bitcoin standard. You wouldn't need a central authority because you wouldn't need people forcing you People that they wouldn't, you wouldn't need a, a system forcing to take because people would just be giving so much. There'd, there'd be so much opportunity. It'd almost be a new problem of like, what do I do with all this abundance? It's driving me crazy. So yes, that's a, there, that's there, a, there a great is a scenario. problem to have. Yeah. I want that problem. Yeah, I love it a lot. One. We have too much abundance. And I think we, we get actually to this point. Uh, I, I have no clue how long it will take. Um, I, I, I I think it will be way sooner than we think because those wheels that are right now in motion are wheeling very, very quickly. Uh, I feel like the Bitcoin adoption, it's amazing how far we have come in just 15 years. Like 15 years is nothing. And we already have nation states <laughs> buying Bitcoin on a daily basis. Like how crazy is that? Seriously. Uh, that's, uh, that's just like uh, insane. Um, Thank you so much for taking your time, Sam. Thank you so much for, for being on. And uh, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions? Where can uh, people uh, see more about you? Well, I tell you what, Robin, you said something earlier that was inspiring. I've only ever made one YouTube video on this, and it was basically my application to be on your program because I wanted to be on so bad. So uh, currently, I am on Twitter with one video. If you look me up, it's just under my same name, Derek M. Kenny. I've got one video on there. If I find the energy and the time, I'll, I'll take Robin's uh, orders and continue to build on that. But I think more importantly, I want to just encourage people to continue to support your channel and watch what you're doing and keep up with you. That is more important to me. I'm going to keep mostly prioritizing, trying to get this whole husband, father, teacher thing down. And I think people would be much better in your hands. So anything that you want to direct towards me, just keep giving it to Robin. And he's way more worth your time. So I just direct people right back to you, Robin. Just keep watching what you're doing. And that makes me happy. That That's... Uh... Uh, that's very uh, kind of you. Thank you so much. And also, thank you for, for taking time. Thank you for being here today. Thank you also for everyone that's watching and listening for being here today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.